Availability, ability, uh, easy for me to say, with a driver of the number 22 Shell Pennzoil Ford for Team Penske, and that is our defending champion of the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, Joey Logano. Joey, um, have a little bit of a cushion coming into this race. What's the mindset to uh, get to Homestead and try to repeat as champion? Yeah, I'd, I'd use the word cushion uh, a little... <laughs> Well, easily, I don't know. It's it's a pretty tough thing to say. It, it's uh, you know, the twenty points is nice, but um, you know, the fact that you're fourth in points just means that if one of those other four cars that are not in wins, you're first out. Um, the good news is we're only a couple points from the eighteen that's right in front of us, um, so we have to race him to to really kind of control our destiny. Really, winning the race was is the best way to control your own destiny, obviously. But um, I like our position. You know, we're it's better than. Uh, you know, being outside looking in, I'd rather be on the inside uh, still trying to, to move forward. So, um, yeah, we'll uh, have to kind of wait and see. You know, I'm interested to see in practice, see the speed we have in our car. Uh, excited to, to work on it, see what we can do. And, um, you know, try to score as many points as possible through each stage and, and have the best finish. All right. Thank you, Joey. If you have a question for Joey, raise your hand. We'll get you a, a microphone. We'll start with, with uh, Matt. Over the hand. Bob. Matt Weaver, Auto Week. Last year, going into Homestead, you called it the Big Three and me, and it looks like as we head closer to Homestead next week, it could be the Big Three and you again, although it was much closer this year. What sort of statement does that send with all the changes in the rules and the package that, of course, y'all's organizations are strong, but the same exact drivers are currently poised to make that transition to the championship four again? Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not in yet. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think there is a common – pattern and trend that you see uh, over the years of the drivers that get in consistently uh, into that championship four um, and, and they're all you know always make it the top eight it seems like here um, and I, I think these when you have the best teams paired up with the best drivers and and uh, you know they've kind of figured out how to to get through these rounds and um, at each racetrack and figure out what they need to do each race um, depending on their point situation, it seems like those teams have really kind of figured that out to where um, even if they are on the outside looking in, they figure out how to win uh, when it matters to get themselves through, um, you know, for whatever reason that is. So, um, you know, you, you can't say it's a by luck getting there uh, that many times, right? There's there's definitely, uh, you know, a few a few teams, there's, you know, probably six or seven teams that, that are consistently threats to make it to the top eight, really, no matter what the rules package is or whatever season is, and, and it probably won't be much different when it comes to next year when the races are in a different order uh, coming through the playoffs. I would assume it's still going to be the, the same guys and mixed in with a couple others as usual um, th to try to get through it. So um, for whatever reason, I just think it's the best teams end up doing it. That's just the reason. Kathy. Kathy Brown, Penny Outside the Box. Uh, with ISM introducing the track compound this weekend and the restarts already being crazy this year, they're anticipating maybe four or five or six wide on the starts. How are you going to attack that, being in the position that you are to, you know, make sure you don't get caught up on a restart? Yeah, that's the tough part about it. You know, you're, you're, uh, there's a few things that's hard about it. Right? You know, when you move the start finish line to where they put it now, um, you know, turn one now is so open where you can go three lanes below the yellow line. We've seen that happen on a lot of restarts last time here. And that's all well and good until you get to the exit when there's only like three lanes on the exit. Uh, so when you're five wide or four wide, um, someone's going to have to give at some point to get off the corner. Um, the really hard part is the spotters are down at this end and they're looking all the way over there and their perspective isn't very clear um, to, to be able to say where other cars are. Uh, so there's a big challenge for them as well. Um, and how the PJ1 acts, I, I think that's still an unknown to, to see how that's going to be. Um, you know, it's going to take a minute, I think, to activate it, to clean it off. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see it in play during practice here today. Um, it might happen. If everyone starts making longer runs, it, it might clean up a little bit. But uh, I think we'll all probably be watching the truck and Xfinity race and trying to see uh, what happens there. But um, it looks to me, just from what I've seen, that you know, one and two definitely looks like he'll probably come into play. Uh, three and four looks like it's pretty far up there. Uh, so, I don't know. It can. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. Go to Bob, then Jenna, then Dustin. Uh, Bob Pockers, Fox Sports. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter this week about 
whether uh, NASCAR should step in on drivers intentionally bring out the caution. Your spin at Martinsville has been part of <laughs> part of that topic. So I'm curious, when you have a flat like you do at Martinsville, what's going through your mind of what you can and cannot do, and does NASCAR need to step in at all in trying to determine any intent? I mean, it's probably it's up to NASCAR to to decide. Um, you know, for instance, in Martinsville, you have a flat tire. Uh, you know, trying not to crash, right? You try not to hit anything. You try not to have your quarters torn up. You try to live to race another day, basically. Um, you know, so that's, that's kind of the thought, um, at the moment is, is how do I continue my race, uh, and get the best possible finish. Um, and I have a tore up race car. Uh, that's, that's probably every driver's thought at that point is that how do I minimize the damage, uh, that to my race car at the time? Um, you know, I, I can't speak for anyone else, um, because I'm not driving their race car. So. All I would do is, you know, speculating on what I think happened. But if you're not in the car, it's really hard to say sometimes. It really is. Um, whether it's on purpose or not, that's, uh, like I said, a lot of that's probably up to NASCAR on, on how they want to officiate it, if they think it's happening or if it's not. I, I I don't really know. So probably not the best one to ask that question to. But uh, it's a tough decision that it's it's a judgment call. It, you know, it, it's hard to make a black and white rule on that and when something's on purpose or when was an accident. Like, how, how do you really know, right? And, and it's, all sports deal with that. You know, I mean, think about, I mean, soccer. Geez, you watch that. They're flopping all day long out there. <laughs> and you say, what the heck's going on? So, you know, I think it's just, it's a judgment call. Um, and each one, each call is going to be, you know, unique and to try to figure out and, um I'm glad I just drive the car <laughs> in this case for sure. <laughs> Jenna. Hey, Joey. Um, it's a two part question. The first part being um, how and when did you learn that Roger had like bought all of Indiana this week? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he already owned the racetrack or he owned the race at least. So now, now he owns the track. Um, I found out uh, about the same time you guys did uh, not much earlier. Um, so it was it was a surprise to me, um, just like it was everyone else, uh, you know. So um, obviously it came together really quick, uh, and only the only way that can happen is just the Penske way of doing it, right? How quickly they can uh, move, and and I think what a great um, you know a great thing for the sport in general, um, just motorsports in general. I think you know Roger obviously has passion for racing and motorsports and all forms of it. Uh, you know, and, and he's, you know, no rookie to owning racetracks and he's done a, a great job with that as well. Um, so I'm excited to see, uh, you know, the, what they're going to end up doing with it, you know, how they can improve it. Not that it's bad in any way right now, but there's always uh, fresh ideas that can come along now. So it'll be interesting to see that the future is going to be. And the second part of that is, um, do you have a story or an anecdote about something that you've learned from Roger or a time that he surprised you or, or you know, anything good or funny you can share? Make it good, please. <laughs> um, they put me on the spot. I'm sure I have a few when I when I walk out. I'm, I'm the person who always walks out of somewhere and goes, ah, I should have said that, you know. <laughs> I'm that guy all the time. But um, – you know, I, I think, you know, we, we all, I'm sure everyone in here has probably spoken to Roger at, at some point. Um, and, and, you know, he, he can be intimidating just by standing there in front of him. And you say, oh, my God, this is Roger Penske. But the fact that he's just a, he's a racer like all of us. You know, he's he's gone about it in a different way. And that's what's made him special uh, and made him, you know, ahead of the competition, um, you know, by by the way. Uh, you know, just the way you dress, right, is, is such a big deal um, to what Team Penske is all about. Um, but also the way he took his career from driving to uh, from the business side and, and continues to grow. And I think that to me is the most amazing part is, you know, he is not slowing down <laughs> at all. Uh, you know, most people might just in his position might just say, hey, I got a great company and just ride it out. Uh, you know, because it's already established, but he is always looking to better himself. And I think that to me is, is such a, a key learning for me is that he's always looking to make himself better uh, and always looking to continue to grow, uh, whether it's his company, whether it's his employees, uh, whoever it may be, he's looking to 
to get the best out of every situation. And uh, I think that's something that I'm always reminded by just by walking in one of his buildings. You can see that. I think that's special. Yep. Go up here to Dustin. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. I know what you were saying earlier about uh, the, the issue of the, the caution and, and, and being a judgment call. Uh, I'm curious from a, a competitor standpoint, somebody who's raced for a championship and been in these tight situations, um, would it make sense for NASCAR to even say anything at this point because of what's at stake this week, what's at stake next week? Would that provide a comfort or is that even something that – that needs to be done and whether it you know you get an issue whether the judgment call issue or that but is it something that even needs to be said because of the of the stakes and what how anything could impact could impact you or could impact uh, somebody else trying to race for a championship at, at this point in the season after all the things that you guys have done to earn that opportunity this year mm -hmm. um well nascar always and has always said to us in the drivers meetings i know you guys stand in them as well uh but there's multiple times throughout the season, especially in, in cutoff races or, you know, the championship race. Um, they always ask everyone to race, you know, with respect uh, to the situation that's going on and, um, you know, race your race, basically. Uh, and I, I think that's your warning. I, I take it as that way, at least. Um, you know, so I think they already have said a lot of this stuff to us before. Um, so. I think that's kind of you know part of it there. Go to Wolfgang and then wrap up with Claire. Uh, Wolfgang from Germany. Just one question this time. Um, it was announced earlier that Kyle Busch will run in 2020 the Rolex 24 in Daytona. As Roger has now IMSA endurance team, did you speak with him about this as well to enter Daytona 24 hour? I have not. Um, I would like to. I'd like to run it. Uh, I think it'd be really cool. Um, but I don't, I'm so focused in right now. I haven't I haven't brought it up. I just I this NASCAR thing takes up a lot of your time, and it's a pretty big deal <laughs> to to be racing for a championship. So I can't take that lightly. Um, I would like to race that race someday in something. I think it would be a lot of fun to be able to do and to say that you you've done and and possibly win. That would be really neat. But um, at, at this point, I'm, I'm focused in on finishing this season right now and. Um, you know, if that opportunity ever comes up in the future somewhere, it would be a really cool thing to be able to do. Wrap it up with Claire. Claire B. Lang, Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. It's always amazing to me, and you're talking about an anecdote about Roger Penske, how competitive that the big team owners are without actually seeming stressed or, you know, acting that way. What do you see in the competitiveness, how competitive Roger is? <laughs> he obviously likes to win. He, he wins a lot. Uh, you know, and, and – the thing about Roger, though, is you, like you said, you don't notice the the stress or pressure that he's under because I think he's just been in, in it so long, right? When you're under pressure f for every day of your life, when there's thousands of employees counting on you to put dinner on their table, basically, uh, that's a lot of pressure. But when you do that every day for year on top of year after year, that becomes your new normal, right? And that's just what you're used to. Uh, and I think that's just kind of what it is. As he keeps growing and adding more pressure to himself, he's just be able to make that his new normal to where he just keeps going on and on uh, that way to where that's what, what drives him. So when you're around Roger, do you feel like you, you, know, you want that competitiveness to, to do it for him, or does he make you feel like he's competitive? Obviously, you want to uh, you know, go out there and – compete and do a good job for him and for our race team uh, and that's something we talk a lot about in our meetings is is we want this to you know be the the least of headaches for for him he's got plenty of headaches on, on on his plate for sure we don't want racing to be the number one thing for him we want him to enjoy this um, and, and that's important to us and we want him to be able to go out here and, and win uh, and keep uh, that same culture that he has established through all his companies um, we want to be consistent with that uh, that is something that we're aware of and something we talk about as a team, and that is important to us. Um, you know, so that's that's just what it's like working for Roger Penske. And the fun part about it is I can talk to someone that's at truck leasing or a dealership, and uh, and we can talk about the same things about Roger, and, and there's a lot that's the same no matter what company he's running. Uh, we have a lot in common. Well, thank you, Joey, and good luck this week, and appreciate the time. All right, thank you.